Welcome to Interesting People. My name is Tom Lorenzen. I'm the host of this show. It's filmed at Chabot College in Hayward, California, here in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's part of the Chabot Las Positas Community College District. The show is based on the premise that there's interesting people everywhere in this country, and they're ubiquitous, and we have a very interesting guest today who's going to get engaged in a conversation with us. But in starting, I'm going to pose a question to you, the viewers. We're going to be talking about international relations today, and you're going to probably ask, well, what does this have to do with me? Well, it's, what we're going to talk about is, what is the future of the United States in world affairs? And is our future in the world going to be a good one, a bad one, or a troubling and challenging one? The 20th century was called by many scholars as the century, the American century, and now we're into the 21st century. And what are the present and emerging forces in international affairs that are confronting the United States and the world? How do these forces impact all of us as Americans and all of you, the viewing audience? My guest today is Dr. Neil Jock. He was born in Canada and uh, left at a young age to come to the United States. He's currently a visiting scholar at the Institute of International Studies at the University of California at Berkeley. He has a PhD and a master's degree from UCLA and a BA degree from the University of California, Santa Cruz. He has a unique background working in the world of international relations and intelligence and academics as well. He has an academic background, a background in intelligence, analysis, and in policy making. He was a national intelligence officer for South Asia in the office of the Director of National Intelligence in the years 2009 to 2011. He was Director for Counter Proliferation Strategy at the National Security Council from 2004 to 2005. And he was a member of the policy planning staff at the Department of State, 2001 to 2003. He was a research fellow at the International Institute of Strate Strategic Studies in London in 1960, 1996 1997. And he also was at Lawrence Livermore, where he specialized in the, in the issue of nuclear proliferation and research and analysis on that issue. He has published a number of articles in international affairs and academic journals and other documents some of which are actually still classified. He has received many honors and awards during his career, including from the State Department and National Intelligence Council. Welcome to Interesting People, Neil. And I'll call you Neil, if that's okay. By all means. So tell us a little bit. You were born in Canada, and you said uh, you came here as a young, uh, as a kid, right? As a kid, that's right. Well, first, let me thank you for inviting me to be on the show. It's a real privilege, so I, uh, I thank you for that. Yes, I was born in Canada and still consider myself, you know, the old expression, you can take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. So there's still a little bit of Canada in me. And as we speak, I'm hoping that Montreal proves that by winning in the uh, Stanley Cup playoffs. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Uh, Boston fans are thinking uh, the opposite. But I was born in uh, Canada, in Montreal, in the English section, and my family moved to California when I was about seven. But I think of myself as Canadian in that um, coming to the United States uh, as a seven-year-old, almost eight-year-old, uh, I felt like an outsider in certain ways. And because of that, and uh, my parents wanted me to keep my identity as a Canadian um, uh, while we were growing up and uh, as we went to school, it helped me see things in a different way. Uh, I think uh, when I did become an American citizen then, it was an act of volition rather than something that was in effect a birthright. And so it meant a lot to me to make that, uh, that decision, I'm gonna become an American. And I'm very happy I did so. How did you get interested in the subject of international affairs? What prompted your, your interest in this area? I think a little bit of it came from uh, being an immigrant, coming from Canada. You're more aware of international relations because you come from a foreign country. But also, my father himself was an immigrant. He was born in Germany in 1907 and then left Germany in 1925 uh, to pursue a career in uh, trade, uh, first in Brazil, then New York, finally in Montreal, and then he continued his uh, wanderings, you could say, by moving the family to California in 1957. But uh, he was uh, aware of international events. He uh, went through World War I as a young uh, fella in uh, in Germany, he was born in Weimar, raised in Braunschweig and in Hamburg, and then experienced the, um, 
the, uh, the lack of food, the, uh, uh, the problems associated with Germany's participation in World War I. And then after the war, as he was coming into maturity, he was 15, 16 years old, uh, when the um, hyperinflation hit in Germany. So he had a lot of experiences in Germany that almost made him a 19th century German. But when he emigrated then away from Germany, and he, he never returned, he uh, eventually adopted Canadian citizenship and uh, kept that through his life. Uh, he saw the world from the point of view of someone who uh, had left his home, and of course his home went through enormous transition, enormous challenge, uh, had created enormous problems for the world through the, the Hitler and Nazi era, and he didn't experience that at first hand, but always felt himself part of Germany, uh, uh, sort of ethnically and culturally, and defensive about uh, Germany's role in the world and gave us as children, I had a brother and two sisters as well, gave us a sense of, at least an awareness of the world, an awareness of international relations, the complexity of international politics that um, uh, uh, motivated me to study the topic. Interesting, and that's a nice segue into uh, my first question here because I look at 2014 as a very historical year looking backwards. It's now the 100th anniversary of the inception of the Great War in Europe when the, with the assassination of the Archduke Ferdinand. It's the 75th anniversary this year of the inception of World War II in Europe with the invasion of Poland. Of course, the United States entered with Pearl Harbor two years later. And this is the 25th anniversary of the tearing down of the Berlin Wall, the symbolic ending of the Cold War. Looking back at that period of time and during that whole period of time, we also experienced the rise of uh, passionate ideologies, communism, fascism, and Nazism. Uh, Looking back on it, what lessons, what, how do you look at that whole period of time that we now have hopefully escaped from, and it's a term I use called the continuum for 75 years of history. What thoughts come to mind with, from what, you're, what you learned from your father and your studies and your experiences from this whole era? Well, Tom, the focus you're taking is really on the big questions. What uh, do we learn from 100 years of history, looking back from 1914 and then the outbreak of war in 1939 and then the uh, actually the creation of the Berlin Wall and then the fall of the wall uh, 25 years ago. Uh, my take on uh, these past hundred years of history is that we've seen uh, a lot of revolutions take place, very violent revolutions in the cause of uh, certain ideologies, uh, principally uh, in the belief in uh, the communist system. Uh, we saw a lot of conflict um, developed out of uh, World War I, uh, the, the organization of Europe, in a sense. We saw in uh, World War I, uh, the um, Germany as the first uh, sort of full-blown unified state. Uh, Bismarck had uh, unified the different German states, the Hanseatic League and the other parts of, uh, of Germany uh, in 1871. And then as they moved forward and became powerful, we saw um, the, the trappings of power created insecurities. And I still think that the dominant uh, motive in international relations is a sense of insecurity and a desire for states to uh, ensure that they are not uh, invaded, that they um, uh, retain their sovereignty. We're all uh, uh, part of the, the uh, Westphalian system, that the, state, uh, the, the world is composed of nation states. This has been codified by, by the United Nations, of course, so that we have this system of uh, uh, in, uh, sovereign states, each of whom is responsible for affairs within its uh, own uh, borders. But the big lessons, I think, coming out of the rise of communism uh, in Russia, the rise of communism in China, uh, what I think of as revolutions that bred more tyranny than they did uh, uh, the dominant uh, thread of uh, the last hundred years. And that dominant thread, I think, is the rise of democracy and personal responsibility, personal liberty. That the individual has been um, uh, sort of put forward as the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the dominant uh, a point of attention for a state. So we have sovereign states responsible for their um, boundaries, but their responsibility is to ensure the, um, the freedom of their, the people within their country and to allow them to uh, pursue their, their interest, to pursue their, uh, their uh, education and so on. Uh, and in that respect, I think the United States continues to be a uh, powerful symbol of the importance of the individual, the importance of individual freedom, and also the importance of personal responsibility to that uh, higher, higher cause. That's fascinating. We'll come back to that subject a little bit later. Uh, 
when we talked earlier, it's the 25th anniversary of the presidency of George H.W. Bush. And uh, he, as the Berlin Wall came down, and as international affairs were changing, as communism was disappearing, as the Soviet Union was dissolving, he called for the need to create a new world order. Has that occurred, or what is happening out there in terms of a, so to speak, world order? Is there such a thing that's possible, even? I think when the wall came down and when the Soviet Union imploded uh, in the early 90s, uh, we had an opportunity to uh, sort of uh, take a longer look at the way the world is organized. And there was a sense at the time, I remember the uh, columnist Charles Krauthammer talking about the unipolar moment opportunity for the U.S. to uh, influence the development of uh, uh, the, the international order. And I think there was um, uh, a continuing set of factors that uh, persist regardless of the institutions that we create and that we would like to create in order to bring order. Uh, such things as um, nationalism, uh, culture, um, uh, a family, uh, history. There are a lot of things that uh, are constants uh, at the uh, nation state level, at the individual and family uh, level that uh, work against the idea, the possibilities for international order. And as we seek, as we saw it back in uh, the early 1990s under uh, uh, President Bush, to create a new international order, uh, it was well uh, thought through and well intended, but we in inevitably ran up against the challenges uh, throughout the world uh, that, that inevitably, I think, frustrate the desire to create that order. And again, it goes back to uh, the Westphalian system. We have individual states with individual responsibilities, each uh, state responsible for uh, the, the inhabitants of the state, the culture, uh, the religion, the, uh, the norms that uh, make that state unique and those people unique. And so it, it just became uh, you know, uh, too difficult to try and impose some sort of order against those constant, uh, those constant factors. When I was in college, the, probably the most important book I read was Hans Morgenthau's uh, book, uh, Politics Among Nations, and which he summarized in pretty much one sentence. The nations pursue their interests in terms of power how accurate is that statement today, and how has uh, power changed? They traditionally used to uh, measure power in terms of economics and military power. And has the nature of power changed during your career, and if so, in, in what ways? And, and also, we're going to talk about hard power, soft power, but going back, has, has, what, has power changed? Well, I think the answer is, is yes, in that there's more states with an ability to influence the system than uh, there were previously. Uh, the Cold War created an environment, and um, the scholar Ken, Kenneth Waltz, I think, uh, put it best in a, a bipolar world, where there, were, um, there was competition between the United States and the Soviet Union almost everywhere in the world. With the, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the, and the end of the Cold War, we now have much more uh, at play. We have more states that are free to pursue their own interests, but more states that um, uh, will not be opposed in pursuing their interests by either of those two main power blocks, the United States or the Soviet Union. As a consequence, there's just more, uh, more uh, players on the stage, you could say. Okay. Can you talk just briefly a little bit about the term hard power, soft power, and how you interpret that? Well, going back to the Morgenthau argument, Morgenthau was the classic realist with the argument that states pursue their interests defined in terms of power. And I think that basic thrust speaks to the insecurities that states feel. There's been a development of those ideas uh, in the form of um, the, what's called the neorealist school. Kenneth Waltz, again, was a chief pr uh, 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 proponent of that. And more, more recently, there's a scholarly um, development toward a constructivist point uh, argument with respect to foreign policy. But the, uh, the, the main problem, I think, that continues to animate states is their sense of insecurity, and they need to take steps in order to uh, address those insecurities. Now, foreign policy can be pursued in a number of ways, primarily through diplomacy, but also through economic measures, only in the last resort through military measures, which gets you into the idea of, well, what's the difference between this realist vision of hard power, uh, pursuing your interests defined in terms of power, versus um, pursuing your interests uh, through economic or 
diplomatic means, and that gets us into the idea of soft power. Okay. With that, we're going to take a brief pause for a public service announcement. Deal will ride off into the sunset. They simply volunteer to look after someone else's health by providing comfort, lending a hand, or simply keeping us on track. Everyone's health needs a hero. Who will you look out for? Find out how you can participate in improving our health. Visit iParticipate.org. Welcome back to Interesting People. We're continuing with our conversation today with Dr. Neil Jock from the University of California at Berkeley. We were talking about power and soft power and hard power and the changing nature of a lot of things. Is What is the impact upon sovereignty? You talk about the need for security and the risk of insecurity among nations and populations. What, what is transpiring there in terms of the uh, potential mitigation maybe of the power of sovereignties? Is that happening? Well, that starts to get us into the influence of um, modern communications, the internet, uh, and so on. And uh, Tom Friedman has uh, wrote a book several years ago called The, er the World is Flat, arguing about the, um, the, the leveling of the relations between states. And so in a certain sense, sovereignty isn't what it used to be. But that said, we still see the responsibilities that states have on a daily basis and the ability to access communications, to um, communicate with one another much more easily than in the past um, has uh, combined with this factor of there being more uh, players who are unopposed on the world stage at the end of the Cold War uh, suggests that, um, as Friedman has said, that the world is flat, that there's less um, uh, room for competition. But in fact, these, these forces that I referred to earlier, the, the factors of culture, of history, of religion, of territory, all speak to the issue of sovereignty, and sovereignty still matters. And we see the violation of Ukrainian sovereignty with respect to the, um, uh, the Russian takeover of the Crimea with the current challenges to eastern Ukraine. We also see the requirement of sovereignty and the limits of sovereignty in Nigeria, where the Nigerian government chose not to accept any offer of assistance in finding these schoolgirls who have been kidnapped uh, and taken away by Boko Haram. Uh, now more uh, in the last couple of days, we see that the Nigerian government has begun to accept the offer of assistance, but that speaks to the fact that sovereignty persists, that they are the sovereign uh, uh, res uh, responsible party to take care of their own state. and. Uh, it's just a fact, again, of, of uh, modern day life. It's not going away, even though we can access information around the world much more easily. We can communicate uh, instantly around the world, uh, both through um, audio and video, but it doesn't change persistent uh, factors on the ground with respect to uh, what motivates a state and what a state is responsible for. We're gonna talk uh, about some broad trends again. Going to go to Francis Fukuyama, who wrote a book called The End of History and the Last Man. It was a controversial book. It came out, I believe, a dozen years ago with the fall of communism and the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, was he right, wrong, in between? Was it a bad title for his book? or how? What's your views on what Francis Fukuyama wrote? Well, I think it was a great title for a book. It was um, very evocative and captured a lot of people's attention. Um, whether or not it captured the fullness of Frank's argument remains, uh, remains to be discussed. I first met Frank Fukuyama when he was in the policy planning staff uh, under President Reagan in 1983, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. And he was the deputy director of policy planning and had sort of made his um, name with the Reagan administration by having gone out to Pakistan uh, prior to um, uh, the Reagan administration taking over, but after the Soviet Union had invaded Afghanistan. And he did an assessment of what Pakistan's needs were in the face of this challenge presented by the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And ended up then, because he was a very creative thinker in the f policy planning staff at the State Department. So I, I, I've known Fukuyama off and on for several decades now and admired his um, intellect in writing an article for commentary that basically captured uh, in, in its essence this uh, idea of hi history coming to an end. But I think what he was talking about, and I'm no Hegelian scholar, but what I think he was talking about was the essential uh, 
uh, uh, dialectical argument that Hegel presents, um, and that that, in effect, had come to an end. Not that um, uh, time stopped or that uh, there weren't factors that were continuing, but that the argument, if you will, the uh, debate between uh, socialism and uh, democracy, if you will, or uh, more broadly, uh, free market versus socialism, uh, central authoritarian control epitomized by the Soviet state versus uh, democratic norms as we find in the United States and elsewhere, that that debate was over. So that was the end of history as he des described it. And I think there's a lot of uh, thoughtful people more, more versed in this particular area of philosophy than I certainly am. And so you'll have to have other people on the show to get into the, <laughs> the, the depths of that. But the broad picture is, I think, the, going back to your first question, what, what's persisting, what lessons do we draw from the last hundred years and up until the end of the Cold War? I think the lesson we draw is that you need to pay attention to what people want. Democracy matters. Uh, our current governor, Jerry Brown, when he was first in office several uh, decades ago, uh, made a comment at one point that he said, if government can't do anything else for people, the least it can do is leave them alone. And I think people, in a certain sense, need to be left alone to allow them s to raise their families, to pursue their, uh, their, their interests, their, their, their best efforts, uh, and uh, the state ought to uh, facilitate that and not dictate to them uh, how they go about that. And I think with the fall of communism and the, and the shift within China from that command um, uh, uh, position to one of allowing greater freedoms, hardly, hardly enough, they're still ex extremely um, sensitive to any challenge to the state. And so in China, if you uh, speak out against the state, or even in a recent example, a scholar, a Chinese scholar who spent time in the United States, he went back to try and uh, uh, develop uh, 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 language capabilities in China that are separate from uh, central Mandarin uh, uh, linguistic focus uh, ended up being arrested and, and disappeared. So China continues to have a, a long way to go before it uh, opens up. But certainly their embrace of capitalist system suggests that the debate that uh, Frank Fukuyama was talking about uh, has, has convinced them that an open uh, economic uh, competition uh, is preferable to one that's uh, entirely command. That said, of course, uh, China still behaves in a somewhat mercantilist approach in that they have empowered uh, state-owned enterprises, they've empowered the princelings, as they're called in China, and allows them to gain um, uh, unfairly against the open competition that we'd like to see. So in a way, Hans Marcus uh, statement about nations pursuing their interests in terms of power is we're now in an era where that continues, but now people are more able to per pursue their interests as individuals, families, communities, in terms of power, particularly economic power, through a more maybe market-oriented system as opposed to a state-oriented system. Is, I, is that I'd a fair assessment? I'd say that's the prevailing message that we ought to draw from the last hundred years of history. Mm -hmm. uh, how that's practiced, of course, is different. There are some states that are more or less able to or willing to uh, encourage and facilitate the individuals within their society to, um, to thrive. Um, there are questions with respect to religion, there are questions with respect to culture uh, in different states, um, again against the backdrop of a sovereign nation being able to um, control the uh, uh, activities within its own boundaries that make it less, um, uh, uh, certainly not like a, uh, a democracy or an open society that I would argue is the best, the best way to proceed, but um, nonetheless they, um, they I think don't have an alternate vision to that, that that's the prevailing image that makes most sense as a guiding uh, uh, vision for a state. That's what you should be doing is empowering your individuals. The individuals have uh, uh, certain human rights that need to be respected. They have the uh, obligation, of course, to be responsible themselves. I have a particular concern with a, a preoccupation on rights uh, without paying enough attention to personal responsibility at the same time. There's always a balance between rights and responsibility. It's not all one or the other. Uh, but in any case, I think the prevailing vision that you get out of the revolutions that occurred in the 20th century, the um, uh, tyrannical regimes that resulted in some cases, um, as Fukuyama has put it, the end of history, the, uh, the rights of the individual, the opportunity for the individual is what should prevail. 
So in a way, Fukuyama was saying we, the term that became popular here in recent years is the tipping point, that, that he felt we reached a tipping point where the market economics, so to speak, to one form or another, and empowering people has now, is now more dominating things more than ever in the past? Well, th th you're referring to the Malcolm Gladwell yes. book, The Tipping Point, and um, uh, I believe Malcolm Gladwell is a fellow lapsed Canadian, <laughs> and I, for that I, I, I respect <laughs> his thinking. But I think what he was looking at, and I have to confess not to having read the, read the book entirely, but is a sort of gradual development to a certain point at which, uh, at a certain stage, it becomes impossible to reverse course and you, you tip forward. And he has multiple examples of that. I think the end of the Cold War was, in a certain sense, um, the final proof th of a, uh, an experiment that failed, meaning the idea of centrally controlled socialist economy was the uh, goal of the Russian Revolution. It was the goal of the um, Chinese Revolution. And in, in the end, it failed. In the end, it didn't. Uh, provide for people what they wanted, which is the opportunity to uh, pursue their own individual and uh, 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 goals and to, to care for their families in responsible ways. In talking about these di diverse forces, John Nesbitt, who became uh, most well known for his book Megatrends, also did a book uh, probably a dozen, 15 years ago called Global Paradox. The term we often use in talking about international affairs, economic affairs, is everything is going global. He challenged that. He said, yes, it's going global, but he also said it was going back to individuals, to neighborhoods, communities, so the forces were going in multiple directions rather than singular towards globalization. Is that an accurate assessment, do you feel, that Nesbitt had? Or? I, I think there's a lot to that, that and it, it's getting to the points, or, or part of the points I was trying to make, that there are certain persistent factors in the world at the local level, whether it's culture, whether it's religion, uh, history, how the history is interpreted within, at the local level, territory. Um, we tend in the United States to uh, perhaps underestimate the importance of territory as something we're fighting for, um, but in fact uh, it, as well as other uh, issues, is, is very important and is in many parts of the world worth fighting for. So I think that's exactly right, that when you talk about um, uh, globalization, that's of, uh, at a very high level in terms of um, the, the exchange of goods, the exchange of ideas, access to communication through the, access to information through the internet, communication. Uh, so that's all very much global, but it doesn't change the fact that people at the local level um, are not uh, necessarily impacted by that, that they, uh, they may be negatively impacted with the sense of, with, from the point of view of the li uh, migration of labor uh, around the world, the migration of capital to um, cheap labor markets and so on. So there's clearly an effect at the local level of globalization. But there are certain factors that um, persist and make uh, the idea that we're all one people somehow uh, really not a good, in my judgment, not a good representation of how people live their lives. I'll bring up one more author who recently passed, Samuel Huntington, and then we'll move on to some other subjects. But he, uh, he wrote a book called The Clash of Civilizations. He wrote an article, I believe, on it first, then a book on it. Uh, he, then with 9-11, it became a very topical discussion in public policy and international relations. Is, did 9-11 show that we have a class of civil, clash of civilizations, or is that an overstatement? I think that's an overstatement. Um, again, I think um, uh, Huntington came up with a catchy title, but that it obscured as much as it revealed about the content of his thinking. Certainly civilizations are different, and if you put it in terms of um, uh, uh, religion, uh, the history of Islam and the development of Islam is different from the history of Christianity, is different from the history of uh, Judaism, different from uh, Hinduism, different from Buddhism, and so on. So they're all different. The presumption that they will clash, I think, is, is wrong. And I think 9-11 did not demonstrate that. I think what 9-11 demonstrated was that uh, there are f fanatics just as the Oklahoma City bombing represented the extreme of, of a fanatical belief, there are fanatics who will take on an ideology or take on a religion and try and cloak themselves in that religion and pretend that what they're doing uh, is somehow justified, is somehow 
uh, to be respected because it is cloaked in that particular ideology or that religion. And I think we need to reject that and not demonize people who are uh, just trying to live their lives and they happen to believe in uh, Islam or they happen to believe in Hinduism or Christianity or Judaism, whatever they choose to believe. It's, uh, you know, th that's their business. Um, and it's uh, not appropriate and I think it's wrong-headed for us to assume that uh, one or another ideology or one another religion uh, gives terrorists any kind of um, uh, moral cover for um, terrorist activities. With that said, we're going to take a brief pause here for a public service announcement and come back in a minute. Did you know early signs of eye disease and vision changes start to occur around age 40? I'm Dr. Ann Coleman for the American Academy of Ophthalmology. I see firsthand how vision problems can affect lives. We are urging adults to get a baseline eye disease screening at age 40. If you have any risk factors or signs of eye disease, see an ophthalmologist right away. Know your risks. Save your sight. To learn more, visit GetEyeSmart.org. Welcome back to Interesting People. My name is Tom Lorenzen, host of the show. We're with our guest today, Dr. Neil Jock from the University of California at Berkeley. As we were talking here about China and Asia, now we're going to move quickly over to uh, Europe and to Russia. Uh, Mr. Putin has uh, just moved into the Ukraine and there's a lot of tensions there, a lot of uncertainty regarding NATO and European matters. How do you view what Mr. Putin's up to and what Russia's up to? Is he trying to reestablish a, a, the old Soviet Union to some extent, or what are his what are his interests? What are he, what? Why is he doing what he's doing? Uh, again, I, I would recommend a number of uh, colleagues and friends uh, to be on the show who can talk to the specific specifics of Russia. In fact, a brief commercial announcement at UC Berkeley at the Institute of International Studies. We have an ongoing. Uh, program on U.S. foreign policy bringing former practitioners from Washington and elsewhere to give talks about current issues. And we recently had um, a former colleague of mine at the State Department and at the White House when I was at the um, National Security Council, Tom Graham, come and give a talk. So um, depending on your scheduling, I would encourage you to ask Tom Graham next time he's okay. on the West Coast. Okay, sounds good. But in any case, I think, um, I think there's uh, sort of a couple of approaches to what's going on now. One is sort of the immediate reaction, which is Putin's doing the same thing that I said uh, China was doing, that is changing the status quo unilaterally. Um, now he's couching it in terms of uh, a referendum with respect to self-determination of the people in the Crimea um, and held a, um, a, a flawed uh, referendum with respect to uh, Crimea. But moving back from that, there's an argument that um, we should have seen it coming. Well. That's always true. Uh, you know, uh, hindsight is always twenty twenty. You can look back and say, well, yeah, we should have seen all sorts of things coming and we just didn't. But in any case, um, there are people who are saying that Ukraine was always considered by Russia as naturally part of its sphere of influence, as part of Russia even. Uh, people will go back to the, the days when um, Premier Khrushchev decided to allow Crimea to be part of Ukraine, assuming that, of course, the Soviet Union would remain viable throughout history, and therefore it didn't matter whether Crimea was technically part of Ukraine or part of Russia. The fact was that politics and uh, governance all came from Moscow anyway, and so it didn't matter. And now it matters. With the end of the Cold War, with the breakup of the Soviet Union, we now have Ukraine as an independent country, and guess what? Crimea is part of it. Well, from the Russian point of view, and certainly from Putin's point of view, he's someone who's animated by, um, as I was saying earlier, uh, Russian history, by Russia's place in the world, by territory, and in his view, Ukraine was a step too far for NATO and the European Union to take, that their efforts to spread uh, their view of things and the, um, the, the unity that's represented by the, the European Union uh, was now impinging on his uh, territorial uh, uh, perquisites and his um, sense of history and uh, in terms of his ability to ensure that Russia remains secure by having that critical peninsula in Crimea where the Soviet Black, uh, uh, Black Sea Fleet has always been housed, where the Russian Black Sea Fleet is housed. And so from his perspective, uh, the creeping um, 
uh, influence of the European Union was getting to be too much and endangering the security of the state. And so he had to take action. Now, um, it opens up a whole range of questions. Right now, I think the, the, the game is very much on. We don't know what's going to happen. Um, we're speaking now um, just a day after this um, a highly dubious referendum took place in eastern Ukraine, uh, where the uh, separatists, uh, the handful of people there, are making the claim that this was a, a legitimate referendum and that the people of eastern Ukraine want to be separated from Ukraine and to join Russia. Um, but it looked like before the referendum was taking place when Putin himself said, let's postpone it. And now how he responds to it, I think will tell a lot whether or not he wants to stand on the sidelines of Ukraine, influence it, and prevent the European Union from uh, asserting any kind of uh, uh, expansion into the Ukraine, uh, whether that's enough for him or whether he's going to feel that he needs to do in eastern Ukraine uh, what he did in the Crimea, which is to um, forcibly uh, uh, occupy it following a dubious referendum or a, a forced referendum. The Crimea is different from the eastern Ukraine in a certain sense from the point of view of uh, what Russian security concerns are, but the basic principle remains the same, and I think President Obama is exactly right. You don't change things unilaterally. Uh, that is, it's not okay to change, uh, uh, change things unilaterally and in a belligerent fashion. Uh, you, you need to sustain that. There needs to be uh, diplomatic measures uh, in order to, uh, to address uh, the historic grievances that have taken place. Uh, they're almost never effectively resolved through military means. Uh, Mr. Putin, I'm sure, would say that that's exactly what he's doing, that he uh, went through, uh, in certain sense, diplomatic uh, but nonviolent measures to um, incorporate Crimea in, back into Russia. But uh, his attitude toward eastern Ukraine looks like it's nuanced. It looks like it's a little bit different. But again, we'll see how this develops. We don't know about the negotiations between the European Union and Russia, but perhaps more specifically between um, uh, Angela Merkel uh, from Germany and Francois Hollande from France. They just had a summit between the two of them. What their interactions with Putin are, what their uh, messages that they might be sending to Putin are, um, uh, at the same time, of course, the United States is the, uh, uh, I, I would say, the, the, the key state that needs to be involved. Um, a, a minor criticism, I think we should have been involved in this a good deal before we did. Uh, again, I would say that in the absence of a, a broader grand strategy that organizes your foreign policy endeavors, uh, you end up responding in an ad hoc fashion to events on the ground. And I'm afraid what we've been doing now in the Ukraine, in Ukraine, I should say, is um, responding in an ad hoc fashion because we weren't thinking about the, the grand strategy for the U.S. role in the world. Mm -hmm. We're now, it's been 13 years since 9-11. There's a common saying that 9-11 changed everything in terms of our foreign policy and defense policy. There's a perception uh, publicly that we had two sort of failures in terms of information gathering intelligence. One was 9-11 itself and the second was on weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Is there any views that you can offer on that, having a background in, in that world of what we what we've learned from it, and are we have we are we more able to be on top of things now? Perhaps uh, any thoughts you can share with us? There's a there's a, a a joke that may only be funny to some people in Washington, but a, a sort of a wry observation that there are, there are foreign policy successes and there are intelligence failures, <laughs> uh, not quite right on either side. But indeed, we had a problem at 9/11 when there was lack of full communication between not so much the intelligence community, but within the information gathering and, and, and law enforcement uh, communities where the FBI and CIA were not fully communicating. That was all uh, clarified in the 9-11 Commission report. Um, so that has been addressed, uh, not to everyone's satisfaction, but uh, has been addressed at least on paper and structurally with the creation of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, for whom I worked when I was the National Intelligence Officer. Um, whether or not that's going to solve all of the cultural problems between those who collect and those, uh, and those who do overseas intelligence analysis uh, and collection versus those who do law enforcement at home remains to be seen. That's the goal. I think a lot of progress has been made. We're seeing positive results of it. So I think we do learn from our mistakes and uh, that's, a, I think, a, a, a positive about America that we, um, we, we look at our mistakes and try and, try and, try and fix them. Uh, the Iraq issue, um, 
Uh, again, I was at the, um, I was actually in the, in the State Department for both of those events. I remember very well, for, for me personally, 9-11 changed everything. Uh, every morning I wake up and turn on the news just to find out whether there's been another catastrophic attack on our homeland, and thankfully it has not happened. But I was at the State Department on 9-11 when I was in a colleague's office and saw the second plane hit the uh, second trade tower and then was in my office uh, in the policy planning staff where we were um, immediately trying to assess what, what to do when uh, the news reporter from the Pentagon, Jim Miklaszewski, said, I don't want to alarm anybody, but I just felt a thud here at the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. Uh, from the State Department on the seventh floor, I was right around the corner from the, the side facing the Pentagon. I immediately went over there and looked across to the Pentagon and was stunned to see smoke rising from the Pentagon where the plane had crashed and, and, and caused so much damage uh, uh, there. So it, it, it did change everything, but um, it you put a new tool uh, put the tool of terrorism front and center and the possibilities for the use of terrorism front and center for America in ways that it hadn't before. So I think terrorism, uh, you, know, you, you might say, came of age or certainly uh, uh, became the, uh, uh, a global threat uh, that we were aware of. Certainly other countries, India in particular, had been aware of the threat of terrorism and other states over, over time for, for uh, decades, if not centuries. But in any case, uh, terrorism uh, as a tool for those who would uh, disrupt our society, disrupt our way of life, and international peace and stability uh, came of age at that time. We have about five minutes left in the program here, so I'm going to wrap it up with two questions. One is, in international relations, the impact of the internet upon international behavior among nations, corporations, economics, politics, any observations you care to share on that? I think what's different is the instant access to information and the instant ability to communicate across around the world. And I think people perhaps wrongly assume that because we have almost immediate access to information around the world on any topic. I mean, Google is now a verb to um, find out anything you need to know. We don't need memories anymore. People will be together frequently and they'll say, well, what was the name of that, uh, that actor or something? And they, oh, I don't remember, but they can Google it. You Google the name. So we have instant access to information. And this is around the world, not just in the West, of course. And we have instant communication. And I think there's a presumption, and again, going back to the comment I made about Tom Friedman's world, uh, book, The World is Flat, uh, a presumption that because we have this kind of commonality, a, ability to communicate the same way through texting, through um, uh, instant messaging, through um, uh, the internet, and we have instant access to information and we, it's very hard to hide anything anymore, that everything has changed as a consequence. Our ability to communicate, our ability to access information is vastly changed. But let me go back to the points I was making earlier. I think there are persistent factors that uh, dictate how people behave and how states behave uh, with respect to sovereignty, with respect to organizing their societies. Um, things like religion, culture, uh, economics, territory, history. Those factors persist. And so the, the means we have of communicating and of accessing information doesn't change those fundamental factors. Okay. We just have three minutes to go. So my final question will be, uh, we have a presidential election coming up in two years. If you were giving advice to whoever the next president of the United States uh, will be to uh, replace President Obama after he finishes his two terms as president, what would be the main piece of advice that you would give to a, a new president coming in in two years? I think the biggest challenge for a president is having this grand strategy and being able to envision where you want to place America in, in the world and what role you think America should be playing in, in the world. Um, when President Obama came in, I think he was faced with what he saw as one war that should not have been started and he wanted to get out of it, and a second war that uh, he thought, at least in his campaign, he said it was a war we cannot afford to lose. Once he got into office, I think he had a change of heart with respect to the second war in Afghanistan. But it, it spoke to the broader problem I think that uh, President Obama faced initially was that um, it wasn't clear how the decision to um, end uh, our engagement in Iraq and end our engagement in Afghanistan fit with the larger picture. Um, I, I'm still not clear on that, and I'm not sure that um, uh, there has been within the uh, administration a clear vision for 
the U.S. role in the world. Uh, I think a president needs to have that as they come into office. They need to think broadly in terms of what the U.S. role is. I would argue that the U.S. continues, as I said earlier, to be the representative of the best of what the uh, last hundred years gave us, which was the, the importance of the individual, individual liberty, uh, democratic choice, freedom of economic uh, choice, uh, and so on, and that we have the ability to reform ourselves and ought to continue to have that and stress that ability and reform ourselves uh, as we see, confront problems. But more broadly, uh, given that um, basic thrust, more broadly, we need to uh, sort of think as I see it in, in, in five areas. And I think China we've talked about quite a bit, but China I think is, is not a friend, but it's not a military uh, problem that we face. It is a diplomatic and economic problem that we face. And so working with those states that we're allied with as well as our friends around China's uh, border uh, to address China's uh, aggressive behavior I think is a critical first step. A second part is working uh, on Russia. Um, John McCain, Senator McCain has referred to Russia as a gas station, um, which I think is, isn't fair to either Russian sensibilities or to its history or to its capabilities, but Russia is not the same as the Soviet Union. So we need to uh, envision a future for Russia where it's, again, uh, a constructive part of international society. It's a great power with a great history and uh, 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 great traditions, cultural traditions, and otherwise we need to work with them as a factor for uh, uh, positive outcomes. Ukraine is uh, uh, an aberration that I I think we um, uh, uh, need to address and, and perhaps wouldn't have happened had we had a, a different approach sooner. The third area of concern I have and would recommend is that we um, make sure that NATO remains strong and we have two factors working against that. One is the unfortunate revelations of, of Mr. Snowden, who I think betrayed the country and needs to be brought back to stand trial for um, betraying the country uh, for his uh, release of information. and. Um, uh, also focus on our uh, continued strength of relations with Israel, and finally um, uh, revive the, what was begun under the Bush administration of a stronger relationship with India on its own merits, but also as a counter to China. With that said, I want to thank the viewing audience for uh, joining us and watching this program. Interesting people with our guest, Dr. Neil Jock. Thank you for being on the show, Neil. Thank you, Tom.